Well, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, last weekend I was not here, and that was because I was in southern Ontario attending and officiating at the wedding of River Bosch and, uh, and Stefan Bauman, now River and Stefan Bauman, uh, former members of our congregation, which many of you know. It was a, it was a great weekend, and it was a joyous, joyous wedding celebration. And as I officiated at that wedding, I repeated these words that come from our forum for the celebration and solemnization of marriage. Marriage is an institution of God that pleases him and must be held in honor among all. It's a phrase that makes reference to Hebrews 13, verse 4. Marriage is an institution of God that pleases him and must be held in honor by all. So the question then is, how do we hold marriage in honor. How do we hold marriage in honor? Some people would say that the way that you hold marriage in honor is that you avoid divorce at all costs. You avoid divorce at all costs. And that, of course, sounds good. After all, Jesus himself tells us that we ought not to separate what he, God, has joined together. And we live in a culture where you can get divorced for any reason, a no-fault divorce culture, and we ought to fight against that. And so when we say avoid divorce at all costs, it seems good and reasonable to us. However, if you think about honoring marriage primarily in terms of saying avoid divorce at all costs, it leads you into grave difficulty. I personally know in my own experience multiple situations. I've spoken to numerous of my colleagues who also know of these situations. And in the last number of weeks, having preached these sermons on divorce, I've received somewhere around 25 different emails and messages from people around the world, all telling me the same thing. Stories of physical and sexual and emotional and financial and spiritual abuse in marriage, that when the abused member of the marriage then went to the elders, the pastor, the church leaders, the primary response was one where these leaders, desiring to honor marriage, according to Scripture, worked as best as they could to avoid divorce at all costs. And what that translated into was, well, let's try to do some damage control in this relationship. And unwillingly, they minimized the abuse, unwillingly enabled the abusers, and left oppressed people, desperate people, to live in marriages where they were victims of oppressors. And all this with the goal of honoring marriage, avoiding divorce at all costs. How in the world does leaving somebody in a marriage where they are being abused and oppressed, how in the world does that honor marriage? It does the opposite. It makes a mockery of marriage. Instead of honoring marriage by seeking to avoid divorce at all costs, we ought to honor marriage by seeking to avoid the sins that cause divorce at all cost. Instead of honoring marriage by avoiding divorce at all costs, we ought to honor marriage by avoiding the sins that are cause for divorce at all costs. And to do that, we need to honor marriage by seeking clarity, biblical clarity, about what sins within marriage are biblical cause for divorce. And then to dedicate ourselves and to help each other dedicate uh, dedicate ourselves to live in such a righteous way within marriage that the sins that are caused for divorce never happen and are not tolerated in the church of Christ. That's what we must do. And then as we dedicate ourselves to righteousness in marriage, then when we are faced with a marriage where one spouse refuses to do that, when there is unrepentant sin, that is biblical cause for divorce, 
then instead of condemning the victims to live with abusers under the guise of honoring marriage, how about we honor marriage by helping those victims get the divorce for which they have biblical cause? For that then would truly honor marriage as God has instituted it. Now to do that, we need biblical clarity on divorce. And we need to heed the warning of our Reformed ancestors in the Westminster Confession that we must resist the temptation to study arguments unduly to put asunder what God has joined together. We don't want to squeeze divorce out of the pages of Scripture. We need to pay careful attention to the Holy Word of God. And so in this series of, on divorce, I've been doing my very best to do that. We started off with Malachi 2 where we learned that there is something worse than divorce, faithlessness and deceit and tyranny that forces the other spouse to continue in the marriage while tormenting them and denying them the freedom that they would have if they were divorced. And then in order to figure out, well, what exactly then is that faithlessness and that deceit and tyranny that, that we ought to avoid, we turn to the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 19 where Jesus speaks about sexual immorality, that all sexual activity outside of sex between husband and wife and any sexual activity within marriage that is not holy and honorable and which wrongs the other person is cause for divorce. And today we now turn to Paul and the teachings of Paul on divorce in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to read together as our text 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 through 15. This is God's holy word. To the rest I say, I not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever, and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. This is God's holy word. If we read especially verse 15, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. If we read that in, a, in the simplest fashion in which we, we can, we would say, well, if an unbeliever, unbelieving spouse separates, if they do not consent to live with you, you should let them go. You can divorce them. That's the, the, the classic Christian understanding which is often called willful desertion. That's how it's, it's, uh, it's described in the Westminster Confession. Willful desertion. It's willful. In other words, you can't divorce your spouse if they go out to prison or they get captured by an enemy or they go off to war and they can, they're no longer around. You can't divorce them for that. It's, if, it's willful if they choose to do so. But you'll notice if you were to look back at the Westminster Confession, it doesn't speak about unbelieving spouses. It just speaks about spouses. And that's because in 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, we read, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So believers who desert their spouses show themselves to be unbelievers. If your spouse willfully deserts you, abandons you, you have biblical cause for divorce. You may divorce them. And yet, we have to pay very careful attention to what God's holy word is saying, because there is a lot more going on here. The contrast here is between a spouse who separates and the spouse who, in our ESV translation, consents to live with. Now, consent to live with, behind that English translation in the Greek, is, is it's not an expression of indifference, like, eh, yeah, sure, I mean, I'll live under the same roof as you. That's... It's not like, well, yeah, sure, I'll consent to that. The same word is used in, in Acts chapter 9, where it says Paul approved or consented of the death of Stephen. In other words, Paul was pleased with and he was positively committed to the death of Stephen. And so the King James Version, 
of this uh, verse that we had before. It doesn't say consent to live with. It says be pleased to dwell with, to be pleased to dwell with. Consent to live with is to be pleased, committed to dwell, not just under the same roof, but be committed to dwell with the person as husband and wife. That's what it means. And so the contrast is not between, sure, I'll live under the same roof as you, and I've moved out. The contrast is I am pleased to dwell with you, I am committed to dwell in a relationship of husband and wife with you, versus I am abandoning that. I am deserting that. I'm abandoning that relationship of husband and wife. And if you, you abandon the relationship of husband and wife, well, then you, you, you abandon it for something else. You abandon it for a different kind of relationship. So if a spouse abandons one spouse, is not consent to live with them, is not pleased to do with them as husband and wife, they abandon that relationship, what now relationship do they have with them? And you might think, well, now they've, they've chosen to have a relationship of strangers. They've decided, well, I'm not going to live with you as husband or wife. I'm going to be a stranger to you. But then we have to pay attention to what God's holy word says. Because in verse 15, it says, But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. It's very strong, striking language. And it's hard for us as, as people today to get our head wrapped around slavery and, and a reference to slavery. It's not simply a, a metaphor. Paul is speaking to people in Corinth who are slaves, for instance. It's a very real thing in the New Testament era. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 to 7, this same chapter, he will speak to slaves. So what Paul is saying is saying, if you are married to somebody who abandons you, if you are married to someone who is not pleased to dwell with you as husband and wife, then that is cause for divorce because otherwise you will have become that person's slave. You'll be enslaved. Another way to say it is, uh, is this. If your spouse relates to you in your marriage in such a way that makes him or her your slave, that's cause for divorce. If your husband or wife relates to you in marriage in a way that makes you their slave, it's cause for divorce. That's not studying an argument unduly. It's paying careful attention to God's word. Now, why in the world would Paul say that? Why in the world would Paul mention enslavement? Why is that his argument? He could have argued on a bunch of different levels. Why does he mention enslavement? I mean, slavery was super common in his era. Why does he make this the issue? I think there's two reasons. The first reason comes to us in this same chapter, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 23, where Paul states, You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants or slaves of men. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. The Christian faith is about freedom. It's about freedom from slavery. It's about God saving his people from the slavery of Egypt. It's about Jesus Christ freeing us from the slavery of sin and the slavery of the tyranny of the devil. Romans 6 is all about this. Christ was crucified so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. Our Heidelberg Catechism, for instance, mentions that he has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power or the tyranny or the slavery of the devil. Galatians 5 verse 1 says it is for freedom that Christ has set, has set us free. Do not submit to a yoke of slavery. And there he's talking about legalistic religion. But the principle is this. Spiritual freedom from slavery means in practice that you ought not to be the slave of another person. You have been set free in Christ don't become the slave of another person. You belong body and soul and life and death to your faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. You may not belong to somebody else in that way. You were bought with a price. Don't become the slave of men. So, if you are in a marriage where your spouse is not pleased to dwell with you as husband and wife, but wants to live with you in such a way that treats you as a slave, it is better to be divorced than to be enslaved. The second reason that Paul chooses this, this, uh, this image of slavery or this reality of slavery is that Paul, 
is adapting Old Testament teaching to New Testament marriage. We looked at Deuteronomy 21. Look at it again on this screen and, and see what it says. When you go out to war against your enemies and the Lord your God gives them into your hand and takes them captive, and when you see among the captives a beautiful woman and you desire to take her to be your wife, and you bring her home to your house, she'll shave her hair and pair her nails, you shall take off the clothes in which she was captured, she shall remain in your house, lament her father and mother for a full month, after that, you may go into her and be her husband, and she shall be your wife. But if you no longer delight in her, you shall let her go where she wants. But you shall not sell her for money, nor shall you treat her as a slave. Now, a text like that, taken from the Old Testament from so long ago, is very strange for us. And it raises all kinds of questions. This is what's going on there. Unlike the nations all around them, Israel was taught by God that when you go to war, rape and the mistreatment of women may not be an instrument of war. That's not allowed. And then when you do take captives, as it happens in war, and if you take, cap take one of those captives as your wife, you must give her time to mourn. You must treat her with respect in your home. You must marry her. And then if you're no longer pleased to dwell with her, you may not turn her into a slave in her own home even though she's a foreigner and you know, is a captive. You may not turn her into a slave. She must be free. You cannot enslave your own wife, even if she's a captive from enemies. You cannot turn the marriage relationship into a master-slave relationship. So then you say, well, what would it look like if you were to do that? What would it look like to treat your, your wife or your husband as a slave? Well, the answer is in Exodus 21. Here, the context is there's a man who has married a woman who was a slave, but then once he has married her, she's no longer allowed to be a slave. And then the text that we're about to read and talks about, well, what, make sure that, that there's, be aware that there's a danger that if you get another wife, that you're going to treat the, the first wife like a slave. And so Exodus 21 on our screen says this, if he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. So what we're learning there is that you, if you treat your wife as a slave, that would mean that you, would, a, you, you could diminish her food and her clothing. That is, you would not keep physical and financial care of her. Although that would certainly also include sort of emotional care. You can't let your wife walk around in hunger or in rags and in so doing shame her. And you must not deny her, just not deny her food and clothing. You're not allowed to deny her marital rights or marital intimacy. Although we have to be careful how we understand that. It's not just speaking about sexual activity. It's specifically not denying the woman her role in the family, also in the provision of children. So you can think back to Old Testament stories, the story of Leah and Rachel, for instance, where the personal and emotional importance of having children is at the forefront. So much to the point where the women resort to surrogate pre pregnancy because they want to have children. Or you can think of the less known story of Onan, who was willing to sleep with Tamar, his wife, but not get her pregnant. In other words, treat her like a slave. And the Lord considers him wicked and kills him. So marital rights is not just about sleeping together, it's about honoring the person's emotional social role as spouse within the family and the potential to be mother of children. And so if you take these Old Testament texts, I know for some of you there are lots of questions, they're odd and strange texts for us to read, but if you take those, then you say, you cannot treat your wife like a slave, you must provide for her physically and financially and emotionally, Family-wise, you must honor her as a wife. You may not degrade her as a slave. And if you neglect even one of these things, if you neglect her food, clothing, marital rights, if you neglect her physical or financial or her emotional well-being, that means you are treating her like a slave and she has the right to a divorce. Now, Paul is taking this Old Testament teaching, this Old Testament teaching of there is no slavery allowed in marriage, He's taking these principles together with you were bought by a, with a price, become the slave of no man. And he's taking these and he's applying them to Christian marriage to both husbands and wives. And so you can sum up then Paul's teachings as such. If your spouse is not pleased to live with you as husband and wife, that is, if your spouse does not provide or honor your physical, financial, emotional needs, 
then they've abandoned the husband and wife relationship and instead are treating you like a slave. And you should not be enslaved because you were bought with a price by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so in such a marriage, you have cause for divorce. The most obvious example of that would be this, willful physical desertion. You know, I, when, when I was living in, in, in West Africa, we saw, I saw this many, many times, and it still happens around the world, where a man goes away to another city to work, sends money home, and then the money stops coming. And the communication stops happening, and then it stops altogether, and he abandons his family, who lives in destitution in the village. That's rather than being pleased to dwell with your wife, to treat her like a slave. In those cases, there's cause for divorce. Now that's the most obvious example, but it is certainly not the only example. We pay attention to God's word carefully. In verse 15, it says, but if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so, in such cases, cases, plural, not in such case. Paul uses the singular in other places in Scripture, but here he says, in such cases. He's thinking about a group of possible cases or situations that all fit under the general heading, not pleased to dwell with and therefore separating from. And there's been recent scholarship studying the phrase, in such cases, in a wide range of literature during the New Testament era, showing that when it is used in such a way, it always means that this is one example and part of a wider group of possible causes. So we're not talking just about physical desertion. A husband or wife who continues to live at the same address of their spouse, but functionally abandons the relationship, and instead of treating their spouse like a spouse, treats them like a slave in their own home by not providing for them physically, financially, and emotionally, well, that is the situation as it's described in Deuteronomy 21 and Exodus 21. This is sin. And if this sin is unrepentant, if it cannot be ameliorated, if it cannot be solved, if it is unrepentant, that then, according to Paul, is cause for divorce. The other way to say it is this. A husband or a wife who physically, financially, or emotionally abuses their spouse has abandoned the marriage relationship and is treating their spouse like a slave. This is cause for divorce. Well, what does it mean then to not provide for your spouse physically? Or we could call that physical abuse. Spouses should seek to help each other in all things. That's part of our marriage form as well. And to protect each other from harm. Fortunately, that doesn't always happen. Because you and I can be kind of dumb. And we can be uncaring at some time. Sometimes I'm uncaring. And sometimes we also make honest mistakes. And frankly, sometimes husband and wives can be jerks to each other. And when we're made aware of that, we repent. And we change. Physical abuse is something else. Physical abuse is the intentional or reckless using of physical force in a way that may result in bodily injury or physical pain. Or intentional or reckless actions that might lead to harm, such as by refusing somebody food or sleep or, or shelter or medical care. Physical abuse treats the spouse like a slave. It's cause for divorce. This is, by the way, the ancient Christian understanding. The idea that there are some people who think that, that physical abuse does not fit into the category of cause for divorce astounds me when Christians have said this for, since, since the early years of Christianity. Here's one example on our screen. This comes from an ancient church father in the 4th and 5th century. He's commenting on 1 Corinthians 7, and he writes, But what is the meaning of if the unbelieving partner separates? If day by day he hits you and fights you, for this reason it is better to divorce. Paul looks at this and says, God has called you to peace. For it is the violent party who furnished the ground of divorce, just as the sexually immoral person does. So if your spouse does not provide for you physically, if he or she abuses you physically, with intentional reckless actions that may cause you bodily and harm and pain, they have abandoned the the relationship of husband and wife. They are treating you like a slave. 
They have shown themselves in that unrepentant action to be worse than an unbeliever. And perhaps, perhaps by God's grace, there can be a miracle of true repentance, but you have cause for divorce because you were bought with a price and you may not become the slaves of men. Well, what then does it mean for for someone to not provide for their spouse's financial needs, financial abuse? Spouses are called to help each other in all things, including the stewarding of money together with love for the generous well-being of all. We don't always do that because sometimes we're dumb. Sometimes we make stupid purchases or bad choices. Sometimes we're too spendy or too frugal. One spouse needs to rein in the impulse buying. Another spouse needs to learn to be a little bit more compassionate in his or her strict adherence to the family budget. That's different than reckless financial behavior that endangers the well-being of the other spouse, such as incorrigible gambling, which brings the other spouse into massive and overwhelming enslaving indebtedness. That's different than one spouse who, who uses the finances in the family to dominate and control the other spouse like a slave. Now, my wife is in charge of the money in our household. We make big decisions together, but she manages, she controls the money. That's different than controlling the money in such a way that isolates, dominates, humiliates, controls the other person. Now, for some of you, you're like, financial abuse, never thought about this before. But it's way more common than you understand. In practically 100% of cases of domestic violence, there is also financial abuse going on because one spouse is using control of the finances as a coercive tool to control the person and stop them from leaving them. So if your spouse's use of money endangers your well-being or is used to dominate and control you, then they have abandoned the husband and wife relationship and they're treating you like a slave and they are doing that, in doing that, they are showing themselves to be worse than an unbeliever. And by God's grace, and may it be so, there might be a miracle of true repentance. But you have cause for divorce. Because you were bought with a price, you become the slaves of no men. And then what about not providing for your spouse's marital rights or your, their emotional family well-being. What about emotional abuse? Spouses should help each other in all things. They should encourage each other in the Lord. They should build one another up and bless each other with words that give grace, Ephesians 4.29. But we don't always do that, do we? I don't always do that because spouses can sometimes be immature and they can be selfish and you can get into arguments in marriage. You can get into heated arguments that might also involve sinful behavior like yelling at each other in anger or calling each other names. Sometimes we act like jerks. And there's no excuse for it. That's sin. But it can be repented of. And couples can manage to work things out, also if they get help. And marriage can be difficult. And marriage can be disappointing. You might have a spouse, you're like, I wish my spouse talked more. I need that emotionally. Or you might be, I wish my spouse talked less. I need that emotionally. You might wish that things were otherwise in your marriage. But that's, that's different. It's a different story when there is a, a pattern of sin that is not repented of from. That's different when you have people who have a sense of entitlement and seek in an unrepentant manner, to dominate their spouse and to promote in their marriage a destructive sense of fear and obligation and shame and guilt and neglect. They seek to frighten the other person and isolate them and belittle them and exploit them and to play mind games with them and to lie to them and to blame them and to shame them and to threaten them. That is to treat them like a slave. And then this slavery, this kind of slavery, this the slavery of emotional abuse, gets even worse when the domination is exercised using Scripture. Woe to the person who uses Scripture in that way. The person who uses Scripture in a one-sided way to attack and criticize and shame the other person. 
We might call that spiritual abuse. When someone warps the teaching of Scripture, the teaching of of the Bible, by focusing on the sin and the worthlessness of the other person to the exclusion of the grace of God. Highlighting their failures and highlighting their guilt. Never speaking the good news of Jesus Christ to them. And then I would add this to the failure to provide to marital, marital rights. I would add the abuse of children, which is a terrible wickedness and a crime and needs to be reported immediately. But I think it also falls into such cases as the abandonment of the marriage relationship and the denial of marital rights. So if your spouse in this way does not provide for your emotional needs, if they abuse you emotionally, they have abandoned the husband and wife relationship. They are treating you like a slave. They are showing themselves to be worse than an unbeliever. And perhaps by a miracle of God's grace, there may be true repentance. But you have cause for divorce because you are bought with a price and you become no man's slave. So we need to honor marriage as an institution which pleases God. Jubilee, let's work on our marriages, okay? In general, let's work on our marriages. We all have marriages that can improve. My marriage can improve, and I can do better. But let's not think that honoring marriage means avoiding divorce at all cost. What we need to avoid are the sins that lead to divorce. We need to avoid those sins. If there's something that we must avoid at all costs, it's to be a slave within our own marriage. Christ died on the cross. Jesus suffered hell and endured the punishment of God so that he might conquer the forces of evil and give us the complete forgiveness of all our sins for our freedom. It's for freedom that we have been set free. And so slavery in marriage does not honor marriage. You were bought with a price. Don't allow anybody to make you a slave. May Jubilee Canadian Reformed Church become a place where we are clear about the biblical causes for divorce and where we together, you and me, dedicate ourselves to help each other in such a righteous way, to act in such a righteous way within marriage, that we will never have behavior in this church that gives cause for divorce. Let's dedicate ourselves to that. Let's dedicate ourselves also to this, that when we encounter those who are being enslaved in their marriage by unrepentant sin, that we help them that we help them also get the divorce to which they have biblical cause. Let marriage be honored by all. Amen. Let's pray. Oh Lord, make us a church that honors marriage. And we dare not be more righteous than you in Scripture by just striving to avoid divorce at all cost. But we pray today, O Heavenly Father, and we dedicate ourselves again today to fight against sin. And we put our hope in the words of Psalm 34 that the righteous cry for help and that God in mercy hears their pleas He graciously delivers them from all their miseries. The Lord is always near. The brokenhearted he will heal. Those crushed in spirit he will save. To them his love reveal. O Lord, make it so in Jesus' name. Amen.